Well, I want to say at the outset, the title of this talk tonight is actually misleading unintentionally, though. When Ed contacted me a month ago and I uh, came up with this title, I thought I would just sort of summarize what happened in the church over the first few centuries. But I've decided to take a different approach tonight. Um, I'm going to look at, with you, original source document material which means it will be a slower pace. It means we will not get out of the first century. I will not be able to cover all the interesting developments in the first and second century in the form of church organization, liturgy, doctrinal disputes, catacombs, church edifices, and that sort of thing. Um, we'll all do that next time, if there is a next time. Um, <laughs> but tonight we'll mainly focus on the introduction of Christianity into the city of Rome and what the city of Rome was like uh, for these earliest Christians uh, coming there. Early Christianity arose during the height of the Roman Empire, pictured here in this map. Uh, Rome controlled all the Mediterranean world, North Africa, the Eastern Mediterranean, all the way to Spain. Uh, a few dates are, I want to keep sort of in the back of everyone's mind. Uh, dating of events at this stage of history is not a precise science, but scholars generally uh, concur around some dates. And I'm going to use 30, AD 30, as the uh, year of Jesus' death and resurrection. And I'm going to take the year 35 as the approximate date of Paul's conversion on the road to Damascus. So keep those in mind, because other dates were relative to that. Um, and just as dates aren't exactly precise, so too as historians deal with ancient materials, assessing the reliability, the trustworthiness of an ancient account is confounding for scholars. And often scholars will look at the same material and disagree of whether this is a trustworthy account or something that should not be believed. Uh, and you see that reflected in tonight's presentation. Now, the story I want to begin with is in the year 55. In 55, we find Paul in Ephesus. He's been there mostly for three years, although he's had some travels. And later in 55, he travels to Corinth in Greece. And while there, during the winter of 55-56, Paul writes a letter to the church at Rome. This letter is the earliest literary evidence we have for a Christian community in the city of Rome. Let's look at the letter. I know in church we typically read the theological, uh, inspirational parts, I'm going to look at more of the historical parts. Paul starts his letter this way. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, to all God's beloved in Rome, who are called to be saints, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith is proclaimed throughout the world. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that I have often intended to come to you, but thus far have been prevented, in order that I may reap some harvest among you, as I have among the rest of the Gentiles. Note his reference to the rest of the Gentiles. The suggestion here is that the congregation in Rome that he is addressing is comprised also of Gentiles. Now, we all know in Jerusalem, the earliest Christians were all Jews. And Paul frequently, as he proclaimed the gospel in other cities around the empire, would initially go to a synagogue and attempt to convert Jews there. But this particular congregation, Paul seems to think is comprised of Gentile Christians. He continues, from Jerusalem and as far around as Illyricum, I have fully proclaimed the good news of Christ. Thus, I make it my ambition to proclaim the good news, not where Christ has already been named, so that I do not build on someone else's foundation. This is the reason that I have so often been hindered from coming to you. So Paul's expressing this desire he's had for some years to come to Rome, 
to, uh, to preach in the Roman congregation, but the only reason he hasn't gotten there, he says, is because I'm trying to preach in areas where the gospel has not yet reached. And so he's spending all of his time in the Eastern Mediterranean, through what is now Turkey and Greece, and Macedonia. But now that he, he says, but now with no further place for me in these regions, I desire as I have for many years to come to you when I go to Spain. At present, however, I'm going to Jerusalem in a ministry to the saints. For Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to share their resources with the poor among the saints at Jerusalem. So when I have completed this and have delivered to them what has been collected, I will set out by way of you to Spain. So Paul announced, I've now completed the evangelization of the eastern provinces of the empire, now I'm ready to go to the far western province of Spain, and since I'm going that far, I will stop in Rome on my way to visit with you. But first, he says, he has to go to Jerusalem to deliver money he's been collecting for the church in Jerusalem. And the, the church there, mainly Jewish Christians, um, were poor. And Paul, multiple times, is trying to raise money to bring uh, to them, partly as a validation of his own ministry, that although he's preaching to Gentiles, they still care about the Jewish Christians back in Jerusalem. So what was Rome like in 55 that Paul's about to go visit? Here's a map of ancient Rome. Now, ancient Rome was built on seven hills, the Palatine, the Aventine, the Capitoline, the Quirinal, the Viminal, the Esquiline, and the Caelian. These seven hills were enclosed by a wall in the early fourth century called the Servian Wall, which I've indicated here on the map. In 7 BC, the Emperor Augustus divided Rome into 14 regions. For example, you see here the Roman Forum is labeled Region 8. Multiple roads, as you can see from the map, led into the city of Rome from all directions. But of course, the most famous of these is the Appian Way, yeah, coming in from the south. Um, I meant to ask. How many here have actually been to Rome? Good. Well, I, um, a majority. OK, well, some of this you're going to recognize. Uh, how many went out to see the Appian Way? OK, Mary Jane and I rode bicycles in the Appian Way as we went down to visit the catacombs. Um, the Appian Way uh, in large sections is unchanged for 2,000 years. The, the original stones are still there. And this is a, a portion of it just south of the city of Rome today. The Palatine Hill in the center of Rome was the location of the imperial palaces. And just to the north of the Palatine Hill, you find the Roman Forum. And just to the south, adjoining it, is the Circus Maximus. You think Ben-Hur and chariot races. That, that's where they occurred along with other contest to thrill the masses of Rome. Some structures that are famous in Rome, like the Colosseum, did not exist in the year 55. The Colosseum was built or finished in the year 80. The Baths of Trajan, just to the north, were finished in 109. And the enormous Baths of Caracalla, the massive ruins of which still remain, weren't finished until until 215. Notice that the Baths of Caracalla are located outside the Servian Wall. And much of the regions of Rome that Augusta mentioned, uh, Augustus classified, are also outside that. So in the year 325, a new wall was constructed around all of that for defensive protection purposes, uh, and that's known as the Aurelian Wall. This is what the ancient Roman ruins look like today. And I'm sure many of you have passed through these. The Circus Maximus, clearly evident here uh, at the bottom, the Palatine Hill in the middle, the Colosseum, the right and to the left of that would be the Forum. 
Now these ruins clearly are impressive, but they really don't reveal at all the full glory of the ancient Roman architecture. This model gives us some idea of what the ancient city would have looked like uh, back in the early empire. The model itself was uh, commissioned by Mussolini in 1933. <laughs> so in addition to writing, uh, the, making the trains run on time, he did that. It, it took the uh, build of the model almost 40 years. It wasn't until 1971 it was finished. It's made of plaster. The model, how, how many people have been to see this model? I am the only one. I insisted when Mary Jane and I went to Rome, we have to go see this model. And it's several miles outside the city. It's in the museum, the, Roman, the Museum of Roman Civilization, a wonderful museum. I commend it to you, any of you, in your next trip to Rome. The model itself is 55 foot square. I mean, it's a really big model and, and covers more than this picture here. But even this model doesn't, I think, illuminate really the glory of what was in the Roman form, for example. Everything was marble, plaster, painted, gilded with gold. And I found a YouTube video, an excerpt of which I'm going to show, that I think probably fairly depicts what the Roman form would have looked like in 55. Now, I would call this impressive. And yet, we, we shouldn't mistake uh, this glorious architecture as being uniform for all of Rome. This is the, the public spaces, not necessarily where the residents lived. Now, in the first century, Rome's dominance of the entire Mediterranean region meant that travel between the provinces and Rome was easy and frequent. I mean, Acts itself records numerous sea voyages by Paul. He would go to somewhere and pick up a ship. A lot of trade uh, between uh, Egypt and other provinces. So coming to Rome from a foreign province was not an unusual thing to occur. Thousands of uh, provincials ended up in Rome as slaves. As Rome captured territory, many people were shipped back to Rome to work as slaves. For at least a century before Paul's letter to the Romans, Jews had been coming to Rome too, both as free immigrants and as slaves. In ancient Rome, section a region 14, known as the trans Tiberum section, trans meaning across, Tiberum the Tiber. So on the other side of the Tiber is region 14. And it covers this entire uh, region west of the Tiber. Today this region is called Trastevere. And it was predominantly inhabited by foreigners, not local Romans. And this is the area where most Roman Jews would have lived in the first century. The largest Jewish catacomb, yes, the Jews had catacombs too. Monte Verde catacomb is located here in the uh, 14th region. It's estimated at this time in the early empire that Rome had about a million inhabitants. And scholars think that there were at least 40,000 Jews living in Rome. Even though uh, they're in Rome, and Latin is the language of the Romans. Virtually all the foreigners speak Greek. Greek is the universal language of the Roman Empire. It was the English of its day. So Jews coming from Judea to Rome are unlikely to speak Latin, unless they're especially well educated, but would likely speak Greek, as did all other foreigners, Egypt, Greece, and so forth. So what were living conditions like in Rome? How many people have been to Pompeii? Okay, not as many. Uh, Pompeii is great. 
You may have seen the House of Menander here from Pompeii. Now this is a really luxurious uh, spot and that sort of becomes in our minds the impression of this is how the Romans lived. They lived in these grand houses with the great courtyards. And it's true that wealthy people did manage to live in homes like this and there were homes like this in the city of Rome, typically on the outlying hills. But the luxurious homes of Pompeii bear no resemblance to the places inhabited by most of the residents of ancient Rome. For that, we're going to look at some ruins in downtown Rome, Rome, I've outlined in yellow here. This is just south of the Victor Emmanuel II monument. Many of you of Rome, you've seen that, it's a massive white building, and the Roman Forum lies just off to the right of that. When we look at these ruins here, this is what they look like. And what you're seeing here is what, as the ground level is actually the second floor. Whoa, sorry, I hit the wrong button here. Man, alive, did I ever? <laughs> yeah, down here. See down here? Uh, there's a lower level. That, so the, the original ground level was a story below. This building is called an insula. Insula is Latin for island. And what an insula is, is a multi-story apartment building. This is an artistic recreation of what an insula would have looked like in Rome. And you have to imagine in ancient Rome, especially in region 14, the Trans-Tiber region, thousands of these apartment buildings, these insulae, built on narrow, crooked, haphazard streets. Uh, these insulae could reach stories as high as nine. Most probably were five or six stories. The walls were made of concrete, although some of the higher levels might have had walls made of wood. Typically on the ground floor would be shops for merchants, although in some insulae the ground level was occupied by a private residence, generally of a wealthy merchant. So the poorer you were, the higher you lived, the complete opposite of today. <laughs> Why is that? Well, there are no elevators. You've got to walk up the narrow stairs to get up to your apartment, so the poorest have to walk the highest. When you get up there, there's no running water. There are no toilets. The, the spaces are small. They're dimly lit. If you're a poor person for bathing, you're going to go to the public baths. For water, you'll go to the public fountains. And during the daytime, you can go to the public latrines. The construction of these, partly because they got to be so high, and because the foundations often were inadequate, and the walls were somewhat fragile, building collapses were not uncommon. It was a, a real problem. These things come crashing down. And if you're in the street and one of these things falls, there's nowhere to go. The, the street is way too small. Juvenal, the Roman satirist and poet, uh, said another problem was you're walking along, tile, roof tiles are falling off the buildings all the time, smashing on the ground, and jars are dropped from windows up above. So walking through these streets is a precarious endeavor. Not only that, Juvenal complained of how noisy this, this was at night. Cart traffic was prohibited on the streets during the day. So all of your transportation of merchandise and goods on these carts and clacking on the cobblestone streets is going at night. And, and Juvenal said, you just can't even sleep, it's so noisy. Since heat Cooking and light at night depended on open flame fire. Fires in Rome were an enormous problem. 
Rome had its own fire department in each region to deal with this. Um, and if a fire broke out on your insula and you're in the top floor, <laughs> you're in trouble. And one of the problems that created so many fires is that the construction of the insula, each floor was, were wood planks set on wooden beams. So there's so much flammable material available for a uh, fire to, to uh, alight that uh, the insula just were really dangerous places to live. But there was no alternative because everyone had to walk to get anywhere. You couldn't just put up one and two story buildings and have suburban spread like we have today with automobiles. Out of necessity, we had to cram people as close to the public facilities as possible, which meant we had to build up. The trans tribum region um, in the year 55 would probably best be described as a slum. Masses of poor foreigners living here in terrible conditions. This is where the Jews lived, and this is where the first Christians in Rome lived. So when the, did these first Christians arrive in Rome? We know that they were there in 55 because Paul's writing a letter to them. Is there evidence for their earlier presence? Well, Suetonius is one of the famous Roman historians along with Tacitus. Um, and he wrote a series of, of uh, biographies of the emperors. He called them the lives of the Caesars. And in his life of Claudius, who reigned from 41 to 54, he writes, since the Jews constantly made disturbances at the instigation of Crestus, he, the Emperor Claudius, expelled them from Rome. Now, he doesn't say when. It could have been as early as 41. It could have been as late as 54. But he says there was an expulsion of Jews from Rome at the instigation of Crestus. Now, compare this in Acts. While Paul was in Corinth in the year 50-52, it says, after this, he, Paul, left Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. Now, if Paul arrives in Corinth in 50, and Aquila and Priscilla had arrived there recently, then it seems that the edict of Claudius expelling Jews from Rome would have been 49, perhaps, 50, very recent. Which would also tell us that there were Jews, of the Christians, in Rome at least by 49. So we were back six more years. Scholars have debated what the meaning of Crestus is. Is Crestus a reference to Christ and Christians? Or is Crestus just the name of an individual in Rome who was making disturbances. And scholars have come down on both sides of this. Um, you know, I don't know whether Crestus is a reference to Christians or the name of an individual, but I, I do think this. We know from Acts that frequently when uh, the gospel is preached in a synagogue, Conservative traditional Jews don't like it. And they create a big commotion about this and uh, disturbances. And the Roman authorities have to intervene. And I think whether Crestus was in the name of an individual or some reference to Christians in general, the disturbances that occurred, I think, were likely the result of the introduction of the Christian gospel into the Jewish synagogues with a reaction that, you know, God's name has been blasphemed and throw the people out and create disturbances in the street. Romans did not like disturbances. They wanted to keep order. Um, but even if those disturbances had nothing to do 
with the uh, introduction of the Christian gospel, at least we can assume that there were Christians in Rome in 49 or 50. There's another Roman historian who writes 100 years later in the third century named Cassius Dio. He says, as for the Jews, who had again increased so greatly that by reason of their multitude it would have been hard without raising a tumult to bar them from the city, he, Claudius, did not drive them out, but ordered them, while continuing their traditional mode of life, not to hold meetings. He wrote this in his description of the events of Claudius' reign in the year 41. Now, on the basis of this, and the fact that in Tacitus' account of the later years of Claudius' reign, he doesn't say anything about any expulsion of Jews, some scholars think that the edict, the edict of expulsion occurred in the year 41, not in the year 49, and that the reference to lately come, recently come in Acts was just a historical inaccuracy. Um, and if that's so, now we have evidence that Christians were in Rome as early as 41. Um, other scholars think that the way to reconcile these accounts is that really there were two edicts. One in 41, where Claudius told the Jews, no more meetings. And then another in 49, where I've had it, you're out of here. Um, and I think that's plausible. Um, I think it's plausible that in 41, again, the introduction of the Christian gospel into these uh, synagogues resulted um, in the opposition by traditional Jews that carried out into the streets and made disturbances. And uh, Claudius said, OK, no more meetings. Now, that's not a certainty. And one of the problems of historians is, how do you make sense of these? You know, what, what kind of thread can you uh, devise from these various sources? And what I've just said is, what I think happened might not be right. But I will say that we know there were Christians in Rome before Paul got there. How did the Christian message get to Rome? I think the most likely answer, and I think scholars generally would agree, that uh, converted Jews from Jerusalem, most likely perhaps Antioch, traveled to Rome and carried back to the Jewish community in Rome this new gospel of the risen Christ. And I think it is likely that happened as early as the year 40. So if that's so, within 10 years after Christ's death and resurrection, we have the gospel spreading to the capital city of the empire. Let's go back to Paul. So he said to the Romans, I want to come see you, but I've got to go to Jerusalem first. And once I've done that, I'm going to Spain and I'll stop by and visit you. Well, as Acts record, Things didn't exactly work out that way for Paul. Um, so looking at our map again, Paul's writing to, writing to the Romans in the year 55, 56 from Corinth. And in 56, he travels from Corinth to Jerusalem. Note I've uh, also circled here in yellow Caesarea because that becomes important uh, for Paul's fateful trip to Jerusalem. And several of us in this uh, room, just a couple of weeks ago, were in Caesarea and in Jerusalem on uh, Father Fred and Linda's uh, trip to Israel. And how many have been to Caesarea and seen the ruins there? They're massive, very impressive Roman ruins. So when Paul gets back to Jerusalem in the year 56, he meets with James the brother of Jesus, who is the leader of the Christian community in Jerusalem. And James says, um, Paul, you need to go up to the temple. Um, 
and show the Jews that you're still a faithful Jew and you haven't repudiated the law of Moses and that will, that will make things a lot easier for you here in Jerusalem. And so Paul goes up and does that. Um, and some Acts says some Jews from Asia recognized him and created an enormous commotion. Now, this is the guy who's blaspheming our law, and he has defiled the temple by bringing a Gentile with him. Now, I don't know if that's true or not, but anyway, they seized Paul, Acts says, around the street, and about to kill him. This brings the commotion to the attention of the Roman centurions. Again, Rome doesn't like disturbances, so they come in and intervene, and uh, they can't get a straight story of what's going on, so they simply take Paul into custody, arrest him. He then is taken to Caesarea, where the governor, uh, Roman governor, uh, lives, and it is uh, examined there. And the governor doesn't do anything, just sort of leaves Paul languishing for two years. And then in the year 58, a new governor comes and decides to deal with Paul's um, matter. And he asks Paul, do you want to go back to Jerusalem and uh, appear before your accusers there? And Paul says, no way, I appeal to Caesar. And so the governor says, well, then to Caesar you shall go. And Acts says that uh, Paul then is shipped off to Rome. And he arrives in Rome in the year 58. And the conclusion of Acts says, he lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. Acts says nothing more of Paul. And the next literary reference to Paul that we have comes from a letter 35 years later written by Clement, a leader of the church in Rome and regarded by the Roman Catholic Church as the third pope, uh, third bishop of Rome, in a letter he wrote from Rome to the church in Corinth. And Clement writes, Paul showed the way to the prize of endurance. Seven times he was in bonds. He was exiled. He was stoned. He was a herald in both east and west. He gained noble fame for his faith. He taught righteousness to all the world. And when he had reached the limits of the West, he gave his testimony before the rulers and thus passed from the world and was taken up into the holy place, the greatest example of endurance. So Clement is evidencing here Paul's death in Rome. Um, interestingly, Clement says he died after he had reached the limits of the West. Now, to a Roman, the limits of the West was Spain, where Paul always wanted to go. So, this is evidence that Paul actually did go to Spain. Is it reliable evidence that he went to Spain, or is it just a tradition? If it is a tradition, it arose pretty early, so only 35 years have gone by. And some scholars believe that um, this is reliable evidence that Paul did go to Spain, which means his appeal to Caesar in the year 60 must have worked. He must have been released so he could go to Spain. He then came back to Rome. Uh, other scholars say, well, you know, there's really no church in Spain that claims any Pauline derivation or influence, and there's no document at all before the year 200 that says anything about Paul being in Spain. And so they conclude that um, Paul never did go to Spain, and he just simply died uh, in Rome without the, the mission to Spain. But by the fourth century, the tradition of Paul having traveled to Spain is referenced by multiple Christian writers, including Jerome and Chrysostom. I think everybody knows of the great fire in Rome in the year 64. 
Uh, and this was an enormous fire. It burned, um, of the 14 regions, six regions were completely leveled, Tacitus says, and four were substantially damaged. Now Tacitus says that Nero was suspected of ordering the fire because he wanted to raise the city and allow a reconstruction of a new Rome named after him. So, uh, Tacitus says, consequently, to get rid of the report, this rumor, Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations called Christians by the populace. Accordingly, an arrest was first made of all who pleaded guilty. Then upon their information, an immense multitude was convicted, not so much of the crime of firing the city as of hatred against mankind. Suetonius, writing about the same time, records punishment was inflicted on the Christians a class of men given to a new and wicked superstition. Tacitus is the only writer to connect punishment of the Christians with the fire in Rome and as a deflection by Nero of blame for the fire. Now, uh, since the Christians predominantly lived in the Trans-Tiber region on the other side of the Tiber, probably that region was spared in this calamitous fire, which makes somewhat plausible the accusation that the guys over there on the other side of the river started the fire, these awful Christians. Now, Suetonius, in his account, he doesn't say it's simply a rumor that Nero started it. He says absolutely Nero started this fire. But he doesn't say anything about Nero blaming the Christians and punishing them for it. He just reports that Christians were punished by Nero. It's important to understand that the empire uh, tolerated a plethora of religious beliefs. Uh, there were cults from Egypt and the East uh, and Syria. Uh, they tolerated Judaism. They didn't care what you believed as an individual. They only cared about don't disturb the peace and comply with the Roman civic religious customs. They didn't care if you believed it or not, but you had to perfunctorily at least um, offer sacrifice or obeisance to the Roman gods or emperor. And for the Romans, I mean, doing that, that is how you expressed your civic loyalty. It, it's like saying the Pledge of Allegiance or standing up for the national anthem. When someone doesn't do that, you think there's something wrong, bad. They're not one of us. And so for Christians, any kind of acknowledgement of Roman gods or the deity of the emperor was simply impossible because one's allegiance was to God alone. So it's for these reasons that Romans in some quarters viewed Christians as haters of mankind. They just, they wouldn't cooperate, they wouldn't evidence that they were good citizens. Um, and as far as this wicked superstition and abominations, one of the problems is that Christians were perceived as holding private rituals in which a body was consumed. And this thought of, well, this is, they're cannibals, uh, actually arose. Now, some scholars think that the linkage of the fire to the persecution of, of the Christians by Tacitus is simply inaccurate. It's an anachronism um, as he's writing you know, 50 or 60 years after the fact. But other scholars think, no, um, this account probably is true. and Christians probably weren't the target of Nero's uh, blame and their persecution resulted from that. Eusebius, who is the first historian of the church, writing in the fourth century, 
around the year 325 certainly thought that. He, he writes, so it came about that this man Nero, the first to be heralded as a conspicuous fighter against God, was led on to murder the apostles. It is recorded that in his reign, Paul was beheaded in Rome itself. Now, of course, he wasn't beheaded in the Colosseum because that hadn't been built yet. Scholars generally in agreement that Paul did die in Rome. Um, and that's supported by this statement of Gaius around the year 200 that's quoted by Eusebius. Gaius says, I can point out the memorials of the victorious apostles. If you will go as far as the Vatican or the Ostian Way, you will find the memorials of those who founded this church. Well, this is the Ostian Way and aerial of today's Rome. The ancient Ostian Way is still a modern road it connecting the uh, Roman Forum area here, the Colosseum, Circus Maximus, uh, down to this area where the Church of St. Paul outside the walls has been constructed. It's about two miles south of Rome. Has anybody been to St. Paul's outside the walls? Well, uh, as you know, it is a beautiful, massive basilica, uh, just exquisite inside. Um, At, up front, in the altar, you see that there's a screen and sort of a backlit area down there. In 2006, that recently, um, the Vatican authorized excavations under the altar to see what they would find. And the archaeologist uncovered a sarcophagus, a coffin um, of stone, that they dated to about the year 390 right underneath the altar. And three years later, they extracted some bone fragments from the sarcophagus and by carbon dating, established that these bone fragments belong to someone who lived in the first or second century. And the Pope announced that in 2009. Immediately above the sarcophagus was a marble slab. This is it. Paulo Apostolo Mart, Paul the Apostle and Martyr. Now, does this prove that Paul is buried under that altar in that sarcophagus and those bone fragments are his? Well, I guess it depends on your definition of proof um, because you can always argue that it, it's not. But one thing is certain, from a very long time ago, um, the Christians in Rome marked this spot as the resting place of Paul, built churches over it, and it's been preserved uh, to this day. So in summary for Paul, he came to Rome in the year 58, and he died there. Most likely around the year 60, if his appeal was unsuccessful, or, I think plausibly, in the Neronian persecution of 64, if his appeal was successful and he was able to go to Spain. Christians were certainly in Rome prior to the year 49. I think they probably first arrived in Rome by the year 40. But what about Peter? The tradition of the Roman Catholic Church recognizes Peter as a founder and leader of the church in Rome, indeed the first pope. But scholars are divided on whether this tradition is supported by reliable evidence. Some scholars maintain Peter never came to Rome. Just a few years ago, 2015, Princeton professor Brent Shaw wrote, the data, such as they are, indicate that Peter died a natural death in Jerusalem at some point in the mid-50s. I'm not sure exactly what data he's referring to, um, but there are scholars who believe that Peter actually never came to Rome. So 
The essential question for the historian, and I think for all of us in this room, is how, are, how trustworthy are ancient sources attesting to Peter's presence in Rome? Eusebius writes, during the reign of Claudius, the all-good and gracious providence led Peter, the strong and great apostle, to Rome. So Eusebius is writing the year 325. So this is 250 years after Peter would have come to Rome. And he says it happened during the reign of Claudius. No earlier than 41, no later than 54. Now Paul writes in Galatians, after 14 years, which would have been the year 48, I, Paul, went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, and when James and Cephas and John, who were acknowledged pillars, recognized the grace that had been given to me, they gave to Barnabas and me the right hand of fellowship, agreeing that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. Now, this meeting between Paul and Peter and John and James is known as the Apostolic Council. And it's also recounted in Acts 15. And that's the last mention of Peter in Acts. If Eusebius's contention that Peter came to Rome during the reign of Claudius, 41 to 54, and we know Peter was in Jerusalem for this council in 48, I would say we would narrow the time frame of Peter going to Rome to be between 48 and 54. I mean, I think it's a likely Peter would have gone to Rome and then come back to Jerusalem in time for the Apostolic Council. But, of course, that's possible he did. If Peter had gone to Rome at this time, presumably the purpose would be to evangelize the Jewish community in Rome since the Apostolic Council said that that was to be his mission. Peter would go to the circumcised and Paul would go to the Gentiles. And if he had arrived by 49, I mean, he may have been expelled from Rome along with Aquila and Priscilla because that's when I think the Edict of uh, Claudius says that Jews were expelled from Rome. So I think this suggests Peter would have come between 50 and 54, once again, assuming Eusebius is correct, that he came sometime during the reign of Claudius. But Romans 16, the last chapter of Romans, might cast doubt on this. I'm not going to read all this. I know you're grateful. Um, but I want, you to, I want you just to glance through this. In the last chapter of Romans, Paul issues greetings to 26 named individuals. He's writing from Corinth in the year 55-56, and after he's written this great theological treatise we know as Romans, he says, oh, and greet Prisca and Aquila and greet Mary and all these other people. He doesn't mention Peter. Now, if Peter had gone to Rome by the year 54, why would Paul not have greeted Peter too? Well, I guess there's possible explanations to that. I mean, one explanation is that Paul didn't know where Peter was. <laughs> one explanation would be Paul knew Peter was still back in Jerusalem. Uh, one explanation might be that Paul was estranged from Peter. You know, Paul recounts in Galatians how he and, and Peter had a confrontation in Antioch, and, Peter, and Paul rebuked Peter because Peter had been eating dinner with Gentiles, but when the Jewish circumcision faction came up from Jerusalem, he wouldn't do it. Paul called him out and said, you're a hypocrite. So perhaps... Uh, Paul's estrangement uh, carried over into this letter. Um, perhaps Paul knew Peter was in Rome, but he also knew that Peter was heading a Jewish Christian congregation. And the congregation Paul's writing to is the Gentile congregation. And so it goes a different way. These are all possibilities 
there's no way of knowing whether any of those possibilities is correct, or maybe there's some other possibility. There are just things we cannot know. But Romans 16 creates another interesting conundrum. In his list of greetings, he names nine individuals he already knew. Aquila and Pris Prisca, also Priscilla, who risked their necks for my life, Epinetus, Ampliatus, Stachys, my beloved, Andronicus and Junior, my fellow prisoners, Rufus and his mother, also a mother to me. He then sends additional greetings to 15 individuals he presumably had never met, including greetings to Mary, who has worked hard among you. Now, if Paul has never been to Rome, how would he know these people, and how would he know that Mary has been working hard? This has led some scholars to say that Romans 16 is not even actually part of the letter to the Romans. Their explanation is that after Paul wrote the letter ending in chapter 15, he also sent a copy to the church in Ephesus where he had just spent three years and he accompanied that letter with a list of greetings to all these people in Ephesus, many of which he knew personally. And so the manuscripts that survived and which have become our Book of Romans was this Ephesian manuscript that had the cover letter attached and it just got attached as one and became Romans 1 through 16. That's one explanation. Other eminent scholars say that is not a very good explanation. <laughs> the, the, the problems, when you go into the problems with that explanation are actually worse than, than saying it, it, that these people all lived in Rome. So, but I will say this, if you're going to accept Romans 16 as part of the original Romans letter, then Paul's knowledge of these 26 named individuals has to be explained. And I have a theory. <laughs> this is just my hypothesis and it might be wrong. But my theory is that Paul, Aquila and Priscilla, we're all together in Ephesus in the year 55. We know that from writings of Paul. So in 55, later in 55, Paul leaves Ephesus and goes to Corinth. I hypothesize at the same time Aquila and Prisca leave Ephesus and go back to Rome from which they had originally come. Because Claudius had died in the year 54, Perhaps they felt it was now safe to return to Rome, his edict no longer being in force since he's no longer there. And having returned to 55, they wrote a letter to Paul. We've arrived in Rome. This is a situation. We've met so many wonderful people, including Mary, who works like crazy. <laughs> and, and people in the, in the house of so-and-so and so-and-so. I mean, Paul isn't the only person writing letters in the ancient world. Now, this letter, of course, is purely speculation on my part, but if such a letter did exist, it might explain how Paul would, in fact, write uh, these greetings to these people. Now, Eusebius writes in the year 325, they say Peter wrote his first epistle in Rome itself. The New Testament contains two epistles of Peter, first and second Peter. And 1 Peter itself opens by saying, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, I've written this short letter to encourage you. Your sister church in Babylon sends you greetings, and so does my son Mark. Babylon is widely recognized as code for Rome. So, um, even though the tradition of the church has always been that Peter wrote 1 Peter, and that was consistently the view of the first 1,800 years, in the last 200 years, scholars have examined that, and I would say most scholars today find Peter's authorship of 1 Peter to be impossible. And they, they base that on what they perceive as the dependence of 1 Peter on themes expressed by Paul in his letters, the, the perfect Greek in which the, the epistle is written, and, and other reasons. But that's not unanimous. There are still scholars that believe Peter did write this. If Peter did write, if he truly is the author of 1 Peter, then 
game over Peter's in Rome because everybody believes that this letter was written from Rome. The debate is whether it, the Peter, who is the author, is the Apostle Peter. But if the Apostle Peter didn't write the letter, then the letter itself is suggestive of Peter's presence, but not conclusive. In the year 110, approximately, maybe as late as 140, Ignatius, the Bishop of Antioch, writes, I do not, as Peter and Paul, issue commandments unto you. He's writing to the Romans. Uh, he was arrested in Antioch and sent to Rome to be executed. And along the way, he wrote seven letters to churches, um, mainly in what's modern-day Turkey. But he did write this one uh, to the church in Rome. We begged them, don't interfere. I want to be martyred. Uh, that will be my crowning glory. Um, and his statement that he's, I'm not commanding you to do anything like Paul and Peter did, certainly is evidence that in the early second century, um, the belief was prevalent that Peter and Paul were both in Rome. A little later in the century, Irenaeus, uh, one of the fathers of the church, writes about Peter and Paul were preaching at Rome and laying the foundations of the church. So clearly in the second century, the notion that Peter and Paul were both in Rome is very well established. Again, um, in the later second century, Dionysius of Corinth says that both Peter and Paul, after having taught together in Italy, were martyred at the same time. That's quoted by Eusebius. And then, going back to Clement in his letter to the Romans in 96, Peter, through unrighteous envy, endured not one or two, but numerous labors, and when he had at length suffered martyrdom, departed to the place of glory due to him. Now, it doesn't say he died in Rome, but the implication, Clement's writing for Rome about the apostles that... Uh, were uh, important in Rome, so the implication is that he's writing, attesting to the death of Peter uh, in Rome. And then the church father Origen says, finally Peter came down to Rome where he was crucified head downwards at his own request. The first reference to Peter being crucified upside down was actually in an apocryphal book, The Acts of Peter, which was written near the end of the second century but um, Origen, uh, who's writing uh, in the year 225, accepts that as being an accurate account of, of Peter's death. Going back to Gaius, who talked about seeing the memorials of the uh, apostles on the, in the Vatican Austrian way, uh, Eusebius says, their cemeteries are still called by the names of Peter and Paul and by a churchman named Gaius, who has this to say about the places where the mortal remains of the two apostles have been reverently laid. And so we repeat that same statement we saw before. Now, um, Gaius says they were, the remains are in the Austrian Way, which we saw, and the Vatican. The Vatican was a hill in the trans tiberian region, and I've circled it. You see the word Vatican there in the top part. Now, within that circle you see a circus, like a mini Circus Maximus. This is the Circus of Nero. It was commenced by Caligula, but finished by Nero. So sometimes it's called the Circus of Caligula, sometimes the Circus of Nero. Uh, this was uh, a practice facility, essentially. So the charioteer, charioteers could practice over there before they go to the big show in the Circus Maximus. In the fourth century, Constantine or his sons built a fourth century basilica over the site identified as Peter's grave, which was adjoining the Circus of Nero. And this is where the present day St. Peter's Basilica is. And you see, the, uh, I've circled that. It's about a mile and a half from the Roman Forum. But th within that yellow circle, that's where the Circus of Nero was. And adjoining that is where the grave of Peter was remembered. Notice, everyone's been to that square, there's been to Rome, I'm sure. You remember there's an obelisk in the middle of that square? And this is what the obelisk looks like. It's 
That obelisk is over 4,000 years old. It was built in Egypt, and Caligula brought it from Egypt to Rome in the year 37, and he set it up in the middle of his circus. Now, this is a plan of ancient Rome. Um, some archaeologists 100 years ago did these plans of the entire city. And this is the plan of the St. Peter's area. And you can see the outline in gray of the, Roman, of the circus of Nero. This is a semicircular uh, end on the right-hand side. In black is the footprint of the Constantinian Basilica built in the fourth century. And in red is the present-day St. Peter's Basilica. That was constructed over 100 years in the 1500s. And in 1586, Pope Sixtus V ordered the obelisk to be removed from its location where it had stood for centuries in the center of the circus to its present location in the middle of St. Peter's Square. In the red circle, is the area of the altar, not only of present-day St. Peter's Basilica, but also the 4th century Constantinian church. And the altar was precisely established over the area that was revered as the grave of Peter. In the 1940s, the Pope authorized excavations for the first time under the basement of St. Peter's Basilica. And what the archaeologists uncovered was a 300-foot-long necropolis, literally the city of the dead. This is tomb, ancient tombs from the early centuries that are shown here in blue. And at the bottom is a floor plan of what that looked like. In the area in the red circle, they found something special. They found this, an edicule, or in Latin, edicula, which is a shrine flanked by two marble columns um, over a lower portion that uh, was a grave. Pope Pius XII announced the discovery of Peter's grave in 1950 after the excavations were concluded. They then found some bone fragments, uh, and in 1968, Pope Paul VI announced these bone fragments were those of Peter. Uh, now, none of that can be proved in a scientific fashion, but it's all consistent with the tradition of the church. And I would simply say, in closing, because it is 715, that if the tradition of the church, attested by these early sources within a century or two after Peter's death, um, is not true, if Peter never was in Rome, what was the motivation to create this myth? They already had Paul. I mean, they could just as easily have, have said, you know, Paul is the founder and pope of our church. But they didn't do that. They said, no, Peter was here too. And until someone can give an adequate explanation of why a myth would have been invented, I'm inclined to accept the tradition of the church and the sources that evidence uh, Peter's presence as well as Paul. <laughs> and that concludes my presentation. <laughs> uh,